Before we start this morning, I just want to give you some more information about the week of prayer that our moderator Martin Fair is inviting us to join with. But who better to tell you than Martin himself? So let's have a listen. I'd like to invite you to join me in a week of prayer. We've come through the most challenging of times and though there are glimmers of hope and possibilities, at least now the chance to open our buildings again, none of us can be entirely confident that we are out of the woods and that there are still many challenges ahead of us. And when I say that, I mean for the church and for the country as a whole. It seems to me right therefore that at such a moment as this it would be good for us as a church across the whole nation and beyond to come together to pray. We believe in a God who has both map and compass a God who knows the way and a God who will lead us in the right way. Will you join me in prayer that we might hear, that we might sense where God is leading us? The week is going to run from Monday the 17th of August through to Saturday the 22nd. Every morning there will be a short reflection, a reading and a prayer. And then in the evening, opportunity for us all to come together from parishes far and wide to meet online, in large groups and in small groups, to share together our hopes, our fears, our concerns, and yes, to pray together for our church and for our nation. Friends, it seems to me that we are at a crossroads, a critical point. What better then that we come before God in prayer? Watch out on the church's website and on the social media channels for all the necessary information that will help you to get involved. For now, I ask you again, please, Join me in this upcoming week of prayer. Thank you. And that's not all. Martin has also invited us to join him every evening. Now, in the evenings, it will be a live gathering on Zoom. And it's hoped that as many people from across the country, perhaps even further afield, not necessarily Church of Scotland. If you're watching this today and you're not a member of the Church of Scotland would would like to join in, please, please take the opportunity to join in. In the evenings, it will be a Zoom meeting and there will be time, it will not be until half past eight at night to give time for people with children to get them settled or if you have other things that you have to do to give you time to get past that. And You can also, if you can't join, you can also watch this on on Catch Up through the Church of Scotland's digital platforms. But during this time, there will be prayers led by individuals. Some of those will not be Church of Scotland. They'll be from other denominations. There'll be breakout rooms so that we can have an opportunity to reflect on a bit of scripture. There'll be some reflective music, time to just be still, But I would encourage you to take time, it'll be half past eight every evening, to take the time to be involved with this week of prayer. For that reason and that reason only, I'm not going to put a cafe church online on this coming Wednesday. It will be the Wednesday after, before you get the next cafe church. If you want to join in with the evening events... I have got a link, 
I've got links to, so you can join in with Zoom or even over the phone. However, because of um, security, I'm not allowed to put the link on this video or to put it on social media. What I can do, though, is give you my details. So coming up now on the screen, you should see my email address. Can I encourage you to email me and I will give you everything that you need. I will send you the letter that I myself has got, have got from Church of Scotland so that you can read it for yourself and you will have the link and the password that you need to be part of these evening prayer times. I'm going to try and get to as many as I can. It will depend on, on other things that I have on as well this week. But I will possibly even see you there at the Zoom meeting. But please feel free to email me and I'll give you all of the information. Anyway, for now, let's worship God. As we come to worship God this morning, let's put aside everything that happened last week and all of the thoughts of next week, even this afternoon. Let's make sure that our focus is in the right place. Let's start by singing, Focus my eyes on you, O Lord. Join me as we sing along. Boys and girls, have you ever been in that position where maybe your friends are saying something about someone or wanting to do something and something in you tells you that it's just not right? You see, that's what happens when we start to be real followers of Jesus and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us and lead us and guide us. The Holy Spirit in us tells us, mm, this isn't right, maybe, maybe your friends are being horrible to someone in your class, or maybe other people are. Maybe you're noticing someone in your class who just seems to be very quiet or having a hard time. It can be very, very hard to be the one that goes against the crowd and says, that's not right, I'm not getting involved in that, or says, leave them alone, they haven't done anything wrong, or just leave them alone because that's not right, it's just not nice to be like that. It's better to be kind, or even to be the one that goes over to the person that nobody bothers about and nobody sits beside and says, is it okay if I sit here and have that little conversation? There's a brilliant advert on the telly at the moment. and it's, um, You see a little boy sharing uh, a biscuit with another little boy. I don't know why they don't show the full advert anymore. The full advert was brilliant. The full advert that was shown ages ago was they're all in a classroom and the teacher tells them that they can have their snack if they want and everybody opens their desk, including the little boy that doesn't have anything. And the other little boy notices that he doesn't have anything. 
And so when he's getting ready for school the next morning, and his mum's saying, what are you doing? He's putting biscuits in his little tin and he's putting them in his bag. Nothing, it's OK. And then when he's in the playground, and this is the bit that you see in the advert now and his friends are all there, he just kind of waves them aside and he notices the little boy sitting on his own. The little boy that he noticed didn't have a biscuit. And that's when he puts his biscuit on the seat. You know the advert? You've probably seen it. Isn't it nice to be that person? The one that is thoughtful, the one that is kind, the one that does a complete change around. I've been talking about a man called Saul who did a complete change around. And at first, people just didn't quite believe it. Really? Nobody can change that much. But when God helps us, when the Holy Spirit is with us, he does help us to change that much. He's done it all for us and he continues to do it all for us. It's why we can be excited and we can say, thank you, Lord, you've done so much. And I know that because of all you've already done, you're gonna help me to do more, be the person that I should be, be the person that you want and need me to be. So let's sing a little song to rejoice that. There's actions in this one. The little song that says, I'm gonna click, click, click. I'm gonna clap, clap, clap. I'm gonna click, I'm gonna clap and praise the Lord. Because of all he's done, I'm going to make you number one. I'm going to click, I'm going to clap and praise the Lord. Sing along with me. I'm going to click, click, click. I'm going to clap, clap, clap. I'm going to click, I'm going to clap and praise the Lord. Because of all he's done, I'm gonna make him number one. I'm gonna click, I'm gonna clap, and praise the Lord. I'm gonna zoom, zoom, zoom around the room, zoom, zoom. I'm gonna zoom around the room and praise the Lord. Because of all he's done, I'm gonna make him number one. I'm gonna zoom around the room and praise the Lord. I'm gonna sing, 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 I'm gonna shout, 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 I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout, praise the Lord. Because of all this time, I'm gonna make it number one, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout, praise the Lord. I'm gonna click, 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 I'm gonna clap, 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 I'm gonna zoom around the room and praise the Lord. Because of all he's done, I'm gonna make it number one I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout Sing, I'm gonna shout Sing, I'm gonna shout And praise the Lord We're going to move on a little bit in the book of Acts So we're going to move from where we were last week We were in Acts chapter 9, we're sticking with Acts chapter 9 But we're going to move from verse 19, the middle of verse 19, so let's call it 19b, and move on a bit and find out what happens next. Read along with us. Acts 9, verses 19b to 31. Saul stayed for a few days with the believers in Damascus. He went straight to the synagogues and began to preach that Jesus was the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and asked, isn't he the one who in Jerusalem was killing those who worshipped that man, Jesus? And didn't he come here for the very purpose of arresting those people and taking them back to the chief priests? But Saul's preaching became even more powerful, and his proofs that Jesus was the Messiah were so convincing that the Jews who lived in Damascus could not answer him. After many days had gone by, the Jews met together and made plans to kill Saul, but he was told of their plan. Day and night they watched the city gates in order to kill him. But one night Saul's followers took him and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Saul went to Jerusalem and tried to join the disciples, but they would not believe that he was a disciple and they were all afraid of him. Then Barnabas came to his help and took him to the apostles. He explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had spoken to him. He also told them how boldly Saul had preached in the name of Jesus in Damascus. And so Saul stayed with them and went all over Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He also talked and disputed with the Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers found out about this, they took Saul to Caesarea 
and sent him away to Tarsus. And so it was that the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria had a time of peace. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, it was strengthened and grew in numbers as it lived in reverence for the Lord. Amen. It can be hard for us to forgive and forget. We have that expression, forgive and forget. Um, and sometimes people will say, I've forgiven, but I haven't forgotten. And it would seem that the forgetting bit is equally as hard as the forgiving bit. And I think that's why so many people, maybe they've been in prison and they're wanting to turn their lives around and they find it so hard because their friends, family, people in their neighborhood remember who they were. And folks aren't so keen to allow you to be who you want to be. As Christians, we have to change to be the people that God wants us to be. And we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we need to allow other people to change as well. Not continually remind them as to who they were, but to encourage them and their journey as we too make our journey to be the people that God wants us to be. For Saul, he had had this amazing encounter with the risen Lord Jesus and his life was now going to completely change. And he had this letter to allow him to go to the synagogue in Damascus and the idea was he was going to root out these people that followed Jesus and he was going to get them put off into prison, get them persecuted, we've got to get this stopped. And instead, he goes to the synagogue and he starts to preach as a follower of Jesus. Confused? Well, they certainly were. It was hard for the Jews there to listen to what he was saying because now, rather than saying that Jesus couldn't possibly be the Son of God and couldn't be the Messiah, now he's saying that's exactly who Jesus is. And as they try to argue with him, bear in mind that, the, that Saul was a substantial biblical scholar. He knew his Old Testament, but now he's interpreting it in a different way and he's making the case for Jesus. It's a case so strong that they have no argument to come against him with. Folks, can I just say at this point that it is so true and it's good and right that the Old Testament informs our knowledge of God and our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important that that happens. But I'm going to say something else here and I'm sticking my, my head above the parapet, but I'm going to say this. I genuinely, with all my heart, believe that in many, many cases, our understanding of the Old Testament, of what God is doing and of who God is, is a complete misunderstanding. For many, many years we've been taught through generations as Christians, we've gone along with teaching and I don't think that all of it was actually right. I don't think that all of it upholds what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying and what the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching. Bear in mind that he interprets the Old Testament in a different way. And now, guess what? Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to start calling him Paul because that's what his name changed to. I'll explain why on Wednesday. But Paul is also interpreting these Old Testament scriptures in a different way. And it's a way that puts Jesus at the centre. Jesus becomes a focus. We sang this morning, focus my eyes on you. And as we look at scripture, all scripture, Jesus should be guiding our thoughts and our interpretation. And that doesn't always happen. The other people that would have been in the synagogue would have been the followers of Jesus. There's, they have still gone to worship. They still worship God. They think of themselves as Jews. They think of themselves as, you know, we, we follow the God of Abraham, the God that we've always followed. Now we just want to worship his son as well. Um, and they're a bit puzzled and they're scratching their heads and they're saying, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. 
This is the guy who in his pocket has got a letter to try and root us out and persecute us. But in the way that Paul preaches, and believe me, he is persistent in his preaching. So in the way that he preaches, they are convinced that Paul has done this turnaround. And he obviously will be telling and speaking out about his experience of his encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. So much so that when the Jews in the synagogue get really angry and they want to get rid of Paul, it's actually the followers of Jesus that are there that help him. And they help him to escape. You know, Paul used to tell us not to be boastful about the earthly things, just to be boastful about who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if anybody was to say to him, how did you start your ministry for Jesus? It's nothing to brag about to say, oh, actually, I was lowered out of the city in the basket and I ran away. But that's what he had to do. And thank God that he did. So he heads to Jerusalem because now he wants to team up with the disciples, he believes that he's an the, the disciples, the ones that we call apostles, were the ones that were there, the 12 that were with Jesus, then went down to 11 because of the, the death of Judas Iscariot. He believes he's also an apostle because he's had this encounter with the risen Jesus. So he wants to be with them, he wants to be part of what they're doing in Jerusalem, you know, and he's fired up. He is full of the Holy Spirit. But they're a bit suspicious of him too. You know, they know that he was there when Stephen was stoned. They've all lost, already lost one good man. They're a bit worried and a bit scared. And then comes this follower of Jesus called Barnabas. Bless God. God for people like Barnabas. We all, every church, every Christian community need the Barnabas type people there because Barnabas can forgive and he can also forget. And he sees this change in Saul who has become Paul. He sees the change and he kind of takes Paul under his wing a little bit and encourages the disciples. He actually speaks up on behalf of Paul to the disciples to say, you know what, listen to what has happened to him. And if anything else, we could do with his help. And so they do listen and they do take Paul to be one of them. And Paul continues to preach and he does the same in Jerusalem as well. And guess what? He runs into the brick wall that Stephen ran into. It's, it's interesting to think that it was the Greek-speaking Jews who wanted Stephen dragged into court. They were behind that. And, and Paul is so fired up. And it's hard to argue with someone who knows scripture the way that Paul does. He's now bringing a completely different interpretation. He's now a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's totally committed to this cause, totally fired up by it. And it's the Greek-speaking Jews who again are angry, very, very angry. And at a time when they have been threatened by the presence of someone called Saul, now, the other followers of Jesus in the early church, and there were many in Jerusalem, remember that, although some of them probably moved away because they were a bit scared. They had been scared of the threat of Saul coming and rooting them out. Now he's one of them. And they become under threat again because of this person who's on fire for Jesus, a part of them, but now the Jewish authorities are, are, are again focused on trying to get rid of Saul, trying to get him arrested, trying to get him probably stoned in the way that Stephen before him had been. And obviously that then also puts the rest of the followers of Jesus under great threat too. And it's, it's funny in a sense because you could almost look at this passage and say, well, what's Luke saying here? 
First of all, they were under threat from Saul, and he goes off and he has an encounter with Jesus and becomes a follower of Jesus, and now he is becoming known, is going to become known as Paul. But now that he's even on their side, they must have been delighted when he headed off to Damascus and left them alone in Jerusalem. Now he's back in Jerusalem with them, he's on their side, but guess what? They're only just too delighted to get rid of him again because that's what it seems like. Because what they do is they want to get him to a place of safety. So they they send him off first to Caesarea and then he's going to have to get in a boat. He's going to go back to where he began. Saul of Tarsus goes back to the beginning and he's going to have another journey to make. It's going to be a slightly different journey, but he's going to have to, to, to learn, to continue to preach um, and to do church worship in a completely different way. Here we are on a cusp, on a cusp of opening up again, on a cusp of getting going again. <laughs> when we do get back into this building behind me, we're not going to be allowed to sing. We're going to have to sit apart. It's going to be a bit different. And maybe we're going back to the beginning and trying to work out how do we start again? But perhaps just in a different way. How do we move forward? If there's one thing that Paul proves to us is that it can be done with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the vision of the Holy Spirit, with God's leading and guidance, it can be done. And so as we have taken time out and we still, it's important, we still pray, we still seek God's face, we still join in with this week of prayer next week. It's important that we aren't frightened to go back to the beginning and say, where do we go from here? And how can we be even more effective? How can we be as effective as the Apostle Paul was? And how can we build church all over again? It's nothing to be frightened of. In fact, it could be quite exciting. Certainly, Paul wasn't daunted by it, and neither should we. So, let's talk to God. Let us pray. Loving God, you are the God of new beginnings. You are the God of creation and new creation and recreation. And as we come at the cusp of starting to worship again within buildings at a time when we're not quite sure what our worship is going to look like, at a time where everything is going to change, at a time where we have to work out how are we going to do mission for you. Help us to be encouraged by those who have gone before. Help us to be encouraged by men like Paul, who was used to going to the synagogue and was now preaching a new message and would still go to the synagogue but would now come under threat, who was used to persecuting others and was now going to be the one who was persecuted. Help us to be encouraged by their creativity and their trust in you and your presence. Lord, help us to build on the foundations of the past, but help us to be build something bigger and stronger and better that has come through this tough time because of your strength and your power and your love and your protection. Lord, lead us and guide us and ensure that we build on the foundations of the Lord Jesus Christ. For there is no surer foundation. We ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. However we move forward and whatever we do, we've just got to make sure that we build on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that, therefore, we have got the very, very best foundations to build on. So let's remind ourselves of that as we close this morning and sing, Christ is made the sure foundation. So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen.